I would like to read also from Master's commentary on the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. This is Quatrain 58. O thou who man of baser earth didst make, and who with Eden didst devise the snake, for all the sin wherewith the face of man is blackened, man's forgiveness give and take. Paraphrase. O Satan of ignorance, by material temptations you have changed man, and made in God's image, into an inferior being. O evil force, it was you who in your wrath against all heavenly virtues, and in your hatred of divine peace and self-control, devised the oft-misused, alluring, but happiness-poising sex force, coiled like a snake at the base of the spine. You it was who blackened with evil thoughts the divine image in man. You know where the responsibility rests. It is not man's alone. You owe him your forgiveness, and you owe it to him to ask his forgiveness in return. <laughs> Expanded meaning. Man must accept responsibility for the fact that he yielded to temptation in the first place. Only by taking the blame squarely on his own shoulders can he hope to change for the better. Nevertheless, delusion was not his creation. God, in creating the universe, created delusion. Satan is, that, Satan is that aspect of infinite consciousness which gives strength to the illusion that a reality exists separate from God. Satan it was who devised the snake of hypnotic temptation. Satan it is who feeds human greed, selfishness, sex temptation, anger, pride, hatred, and other ego-affirming traits. Satan works consciously to counteract the God-reminding qualities of self-control, unselfishness, soul bliss, forgiveness, humbleness, and love. Man must courageously accept responsibility for his own downfall. Self-pity would only set the seal on his destruction. At the same time, too stern an attitude, if not offset by the sweetness of love, would alienate alienate man from God. And what is God if not love itself? It is important to understand that man's state, when viewed impersonally, is not only blameworthy but also deserving of compassion. God in his divine love yearns to help his human children who are subject to such numerous temptations. Man receives during his youth especially too few warnings against them from the side of wisdom. It would not show compassion, however, but debilitating pity for God to deprive mankind of the opportunity to grow. For spiritual development, inner strength is necessary. Without it, we would never deserve the kingdom of God, nor have the strength of will and the clarity of wisdom to enter it. I wrote sometimes a um, editorial comment um, because I didn't want to add anything to what Master had said, and yet certain thoughts occurred to me. In this case, the thought that occurred to me was one that I mentioned this week during the classes that somebody wrote um, uh, criticizing me for uh, quoting Master in speaking of Satan at all, saying that, that uh, all modern ministers are agreed that Satan doesn't exist. Well, I don't know how a disciple, which he is, could make such a statement. But anyway, I felt, in, I felt inclined to uh, write him a strong reply. And I've also written an expansion on this for the sake of those who still have doubts on the subject. So this is the <laughs> editorial comment. Because to modern minds, Satan seems an antiquated concept, it may be well to conclude here with a more detailed discussion of the metaphysical meaning of this term. Obviously, in a universe containing hundreds of billions of galaxies, to speak of Satan personally, 
For instance, as a man with horns, a tail, and a goatee, and all dressed in red, is as absurd as to speak of God as an old man who might have posed for Michelangelo when he painted The Last Judgment and the creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel. And yet God is personal in his relation to us. Omnipresence implies infinitesimality, Katsuks, <laughs> as much as it does infinity. What are you going to do? The language gives us these words. <laughs> God is as much present in the electron as in the vastest galaxy. Devotees through the ages have testified that he listens and responds to his children's loving prayers. This being the case, it is reasonable to suppose that that consciousness which maintains creation in a state of balance by projecting energy outward in opposition to spirit's inward drawing love is omnipresent also and must be conscious of us individually even as God is. God himself does not project evil. Initially, the creation he projects is a reflection or echo of his own perfection. Relativity is, however, intrinsic to, to creation itself. Only the Supreme Spirit beyond all relativity is absolute. <coughs> Evil results from the fact that that outward flow of consciousness is given its own innate impulse to continue moving in the direction of outwardness, of apparent separation from God. The greater the consciousness of separation, the dimmer the echo of perfection. The impulse to increase the distance, so to speak, between creation and its source in the divine increases also the distance between perfection and imperfection. The outward flow of energy generates its own magnetism, which is capable of drawing the consciousness of human beings away from their inner center in God. Yogananda once said, I used to think that Satan was just a mental concept. Now that I have realized God, I join my testimony to that of all who found him before me. Satan exists. He is a conscious force and works deliberately to keep mankind under the sway of delusion. God and Satan can influence us, Yogananda explained, only to the extent that we allow them to. If our thoughts are of God, he will uplift us in his bliss. And if they are Godward in the sense of kind, serviceful and spiritually self-expansive, he will draw, draw us toward that bliss. But if our hearts yearn for material enjoyments and harbor sensory attachments, we shall find ourselves being drawn toward outwardness by a power greater than our own. Herein lies the secret of divine grace, without which no lasting good ever comes, but which is granted only to the degree of our receptivity to it. It is never imposed. Ultimately, what we are dealing with in life is currents of consciousness, not unconscious matter. There are, there are angelic powers capable of inspiring us and lifting us up to the spiritual heights. And there are demonic powers capable of dragging us down to the depths of spiritual darkness, of misery and pain. As there are no imaginable limits to goodness and virtue, so there are no imaginable limits to evil, spiritual and mental confusion, ego contraction, bitterness, and suffering. Man's is the choice. We cannot but be influenced, for we are part of an infinite reality from which it is impossible to divorce ourselves, despite our most desperate affirmations of egoic pride. We can choose God, or we can decide to remain identified with his cosmic dream. Which one will influence us is no one's choice but our own. That's such a great book. I really 
find such inspiration in it and found such inspiration in working on it. It's very thrilling to have the opportunity to, to work on Master's words because as you do so, you go more and more deeply into meanings that otherwise sort of slip over you. It's so, in the case of the autobiography of a yogi, there's so much depth in that book. And yet people reading it, because it flows so beautifully and the stories are so exciting and thrilling and uplifting, one tends to overlook these, these deep teachings. For example, I said this many years ago during a class I was giving for the monks at Mount Washington. And Ananda Moy said, well, can you give us an example? Um, uh, sort of challengingly, in fact, I don't think it had occurred to him that there was so much depth there, but maybe I'm doing him an injustice in saying that. I'm willing to think so. But I just opened the, the autobiography at random, and immediately my eye, my eye fell on that passage where Master says that thoughts are universally, not individually rooted. A person cannot create truth, he can only perceive it. What a deep truth that is. Mind you, this universe has two possible and absolutely mutually exclusive alternatives. One is everything is unconscious. The other is everything is conscious. You can't have anything in between. Now sometimes the thought of, it, of consciousness being absolute and eternal is a bit frightening. I know somebody was saying to me years ago, I just can't imagine wanting to live eternally. Well, you're stuck with it. You can't help it. <laughs> it's sort of, the mind sometimes thinks, well, how can it be? I mean, eternal consciousness? Uh, there's no alternative to it. There isn't anything else that exists. Kind of a, an appalling thought. But the thought that science gives us as an alternative Namely, that everything is unconscious, everything happens by sheer accident, everything, <coughs> everything is um, uh, sort of coming up from unconsciousness to the point where because of certain electronic flows of energy in the brain, consciousness is produced seems to me the most colossal superstition. It's an absurdity, and yet this is basically what science has forced people to think along in uh, deciding what consciousness means. You can't define consciousness, but you'll find that today, as much as ever, scientists keep saying that, well, we hope to be able to create uh, matter or robots in such a way that they will be as conscious as you and I. My answer to that is that if you succeed in producing a robot that is just like a human being, it will attract an entity from the astral world which will animate that robot. But the robot will not be able to animate itself. You can't create, Master said, if you have a, uh, somebody was saying to him, a scientist, superciliously, that um, the, the uh, uh, universe is just, just an accident. It didn't happen by divine will or divine consciousness. Master said, if you had a load of, uh, he said, it's all um, the electrons, which are the building, no, the molecule, what is the atoms, are the building blocks of creation. Master said, well, the atoms are like bricks. If you leave them as a tumble in a yard, they're not going to form themselves into a building. <laughs> and if there's a storm that somehow moves them, they may form themselves somehow into a heap, but they wouldn't form themselves into a building. If you had a computer with as many words as are in the Holy Bible and had this computer go through all the possible permutations and combinations that um, are in the Bible, <coughs> in all possible uh, variations, <coughs> excuse me, if and I imagine that in billions of years, it's, it's possible, it does seem not likely, but let's assume that it's possible, that the, uh, this uh, constant changing of the computer 
would finally give you the exact sequence of words that are in the Bible. Wouldn't mean a damn thing. <laughs> a nanosecond later, it would be a completely different thing. Where is the intelligence? Say, ah, there it is. It doesn't happen that way. There's got to be intelligence. Somebody was showing me a skull to show me how the sinuses work because I've had sinusitis. And I looked at that thing and I said, there alone is a sufficient disproof of anybody who doubts the reality of God. It's just inconceivable. I wrote Isaac Asimov one time, posing him. He was very gracious. He was an extraordinary man. And uh, yet he always answered his letters. I don't know about always, but I know my dad wrote him a letter and he got an answer, and I wrote him a letter and I got an answer. But it was he was a scientist and had their, their um, superstitions. And so I was saying to him, how is it possible to account for certain anomalies in evolution. I was working on crises in modern thought, and I wanted to get the feedback of scientists on what I was writing. And he wrote back that, well, in a long period of time, all these things are possible. Well, I begin to doubt it. I don't think any such thing is possible. There is certainly one thing that we know. We know that we live. We know that we're alive. We know that we're conscious. And Descartes, who said he was always puzzled by this question of existence. And he finally came upon what to him was a revelation, I think, therefore I am. Well, the fact is that you're a lot more aware of being when you're not thinking. <laughs> Moreover, I would say that a worm possibly is not thinking at all. And yet, if you prick it with anything, it'll squirm. It's conscious. It can react. But it doesn't think the way you and I do. And certainly when you're most deeply engrossed in an inspiration or in a beautiful symphony or whatever it may be in deep meditation, you're more aware, not less so, if you're not thinking. Somebody who's watching a beautiful sunset and thinks, gee, I bet I could, I could, I could uh, do something like that and starts thinking how we would do it. Or thinks, wow, that sunset looks just like scrambled eggs in the morning. It doesn't. I don't think he would be as aware as somebody who's just completely engrossed in that beauty. So we've got to understand that, well, the reason Descartes couldn't say I'm conscious, therefore I am, is that he'd been trained in scientific methodology, and you have to look at something objective if you can judge it. Well, you're judging with consciousness, therefore you can't judge consciousness. You can't see it objectively. But of course, it's with consciousness that he could make that judgment in the first place. The truth is, and there's a lovely joke that Nirmala told me once, that Descartes went into a bar and asked for, uh, and the man asked him, oh, would you glass, like a glass of wine? And uh, he said, I don't think, and suddenly he disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> I know I got that wrong, Nirmala. I like it better this way, but for your sake, I left it that way in my book. Um, the, the fact is that consciousness is not like a Sunday uh, cherry on top of a Sunday. Consciousness is what produces everything. And this is one of the fascinating things that have been discovered, beginning with uh, Bosch, Jagadish Chandra Bosch, and then Bonhoeffer, I believe it was, who found, I'm not sure it was he, it was another German scientist with uh, experiments with wire, electric wire, or wire through which electricity passed. He found there was no way to separate that, uh, the reactions of wire, from the reactions of the human nervous system. And others have discovered that the, uh, uh, there are responses in plants that are altogether the s similar, the same, basically, as in human beings. Bose said that I, there is no difference, discernible difference, between a um, uh, photographic cell and the eyesight. All of these things are, and this is what they've discovered, except that, of course, most people don't accept it yet. But all scientific discoveries take a little time, especially one that strikes right at the root of all scientific thought. It seems inevitable, however, to state that the 
basis of life is consciousness. That metals are conscious, rocks are conscious, everything is conscious. And of course, this fits entirely with the teaching of Vedanta and yoga, that everything is an evolution of consciousness because it's all God's dream. He didn't have matter out there to work on. He had only himself, his own consciousness. He brought it into existence. And indeed, this is one of the things that make people begin to seek spiritually is the thought that when they sleep, they, they dream. Why couldn't this world, which seems dreamlike in many ways, be the same thing? And the truth is, in fact, it's impossible to say nothing is consciousness. It becomes possible to say everything is conscious. And it's not possible to say some things, that some things are and some things aren't. They are absolutes and they're mutually exclusive. Now, when we tie this down to Satan, what is Satan? It's a part of consciousness. It's not something unreal. People like to think that they, they tempt themselves, and they do to an extent, but there's more to it than that. There's a power there, and it's, it's very strong. Master told a curious story. When he was in Bombay, he, he was lying in bed when suddenly this huge black shape came and sat on his chest and said, and now where is your God? The master said, he's right inside me, and the man, the shape disappeared. But you read the lives of saints and you see that all of them have been in one way or another tempted by Satan, tested by Satan, who does his best to pull them back to the path. Satan is there. When you find between two serious, deep, loving friends, suddenly um, disharmony introduced that is not of their waking or their making or their desire. This force is always there looking for an in. People with the vision to see these things say that outside of bars there are lots of evil entities waiting to jump into souls that become sufficiently blanked out with alcohol that they can possess them. Possession, too, is a fact. I don't say these things to frighten you, but you know I had a very curious experience, and I've mentioned it in the path also. I'd heard about these disembodied spirits, and I was very new on the path, and the whole thing was just a gas to me. I just didn't know. It was marvelous, but I, I couldn't quite tune into a lot of it. And so when I heard about um, possession, I thought, well, wow, that really blows my mind. They didn't <laughs> have that expression in those days, but essentially I gave the 1948 version. <laughs> and so... One night I was, as I was asleep, and in my sleep, I suddenly I was in a party, dreaming in it that I was in a party, and I remember it clearly still. I suddenly thought, oh, it's time for me to go and meet a disincarnate spirit. <laughs> and I left the room, and I can see clearly the empty floorboards of the room I passed through into another room, and then I said, okay, here I am. I want to, hear, I want to understand what this is all about. Come. I was pretty stupid, but anyway, <clears throat> I did. And all of a sudden, the door began, the floor began to heave up and down, and I found myself being sucked out of the window into a gray mist, and I tried to come back, and I realized I, I, I wasn't sure I had the willpower to fight it. And so I said, Master! And instantly it disappeared. And at the same time, also, I heard a very powerful ohm. Well, that same evening, one of the monks there, Mr. Rogers, who became known as Devananda, was lying in his room um, asleep when suddenly there was a loud pounding on the door. Hello, who's in there? Who's in there? And he said, oh, Gene Hauft. That was Gene Hauft. It wasn't, wasn't Devananda. And uh, he said, I don't want you. I want Don Walters. <laughs> and he stormed out, and that was all. And I asked Master about this, and he said, yes, these things happen. Don't worry about it. The power of the gurus is great, but do remember what I did. <laughs> You'd be amazed how many times Master has come. You know, there was somebody 
in Czechoslovakia. He was Professor Novitsky in Prague, who was the head of the SRF Center in those days. He's long left this body. But uh, people used to come to him, and he would teach them if he thought it was safe to. One man came to him with a great show of devotion and said that I, I uh, am an aspirant in yoga, and I would like to have you teach me uh, what these teachings are all about. And Novitsky didn't know if this man was genuine or not. He, if he was genuine, he wouldn't want to disappoint him. But if he wasn't, he knew he shouldn't or he'd go to prison. And so he asked Master, and Master appeared behind him and like that, just shook his head. And so he didn't say anything. He said, I, I really don't know what you're talking about. And later it, was, it turned out that the man was a government informer. Well, I've heard many stories like this, all sorts of stories. There was one I mentioned not too long ago, of, uh, and this is another case, but still similar, of one of the members who had taken Kriya from me, and she was married, and her husband was very anti-everything spiritual. And they were in the car together, and uh, he was ranting against Yogananda and all this nonsense. And she just had had enough with it. And she just said, Master, make him stop. All of a sudden, he, sp he stopped speaking. Didn't say another word. They drove all the way home. He went indoors. Didn't say anything. How many stories. But mind you, there's something that, that uh, is there. And you must be aware of it. Not to be aware in such a way as to be afraid to be too devil conscious. I've written a song which Ram sings delightfully. Yes, it's devil worship. And actually, I thought of asking you to sing it, but I thought, well, maybe I won't. They've had a beautiful song. And uh, <clears throat> uh, anyway, by constantly thinking about the devil, that's where you'll go. That's where your consciousness is. Don't dwell on it. Don't fear it. Think of God. When people think too much of Satan, that's, that's what they attract. But if we think of God, everything, we're always and strongly protected. Nonetheless, that force is there. And in your thoughts, if there's the least little opening, in he'll come. It's not just Satan, some individual entity, but he has many, many cohorts. Somebody, I read a story about somebody in... Russia before the revolution, so it's quite an old story. And he was in the hospital, and his heart stopped on the operating table. All of a sudden, he found himself outside his body. And uh, he didn't know what to do. He was completely bewildered. And he saw one of the nuns in the room there, a nursing nun, stop before an icon and pray. And the moment she prayed, Shows you how important prayer is for the dead and for li li the living also. And uh, as soon as she prayed, suddenly two angels appeared. And he found himself being sucked up into a light. But what was interesting in his case, evidently he had a very worldly uh, karma to work out too. There were a lot of devils trying to grab him and hold on to him while he rose. And he just hung on to these angels and was able to elude them. But these things are realities also, that when you go, it isn't as if everybody melts in the light by no means. Remember, how you live is a very important thing. Death is your final exam. So live in the right way, because I, I, I was thinking of that play the other evening, beautifully done, about from the Mahabharata, However, I was thinking of all these Duryodhana and Sakuni and so on. I was thinking, why all this excitement for a kingdom? If you get it even, you're going to lose it in no time. Life is just like that. Before you know it, you've lost it. Why get excited about anything material? Why get ambitious about anything outward? It's so temporary. And so, if we can understand that this life is just a short episode, Satan, however, brings you down farther and farther and farther 
into the immediate moment, into the particular instant or, uh, and inc incident, into the small, and makes you forget the large. We need to keep our consciousness always enlarged. Always be aware of the greater realities at stake. Always be aware that that's the only thing you'll keep with you. Satan makes you think that, oh, that'll take care of itself. Now is what's real. It isn't real at all. If you can really withdraw your mind enough from it, then you will see that your reality is eternal. So live in God. Don't be afraid of these things. They do exist, however. And I think that one of the greatest successes Satan has had has been to convince people that he doesn't exist. <laughs> That's really a great victory for him. But he's right there, and you can see him in this world, light and darkness, fighting each other more violently than ever before. We have the choice. We can be soldiers of light. We can fight on the side of goodness and charity and love and cooperation and humility. We have that choice. It's an absolute choice. But God can use us if we will let him. He can't use us if we won't. We must be willing instruments. And when at donors, teas, and different things, some of our people say, well, you have done so much. I don't like to think that way. We have done so much. Each one of us does what he can. And if what we can do is only plant flowers, that's not less important. If you have money to give, that's very good. Not more important. It's your way of serving God. Whatever talent God gives you, use it. God has given me certain gifts. I feel honored to have been able to use them. And when people say, well, you should just meditate, well, I might have bought that argument because I was strongly inclined to be a hermit. But the fact that my master told me I must work and he gave me no choice, I have accepted that. At first, kicking and screaming, you might say, with reluctance. But gradually I came to see that that was really my road to paradise, my road to inner joy. I wouldn't have gained what I know I've gained if it hadn't been for that. So be warriors of the light. Whatever you have to give, think of it not as yours. That's the beginning of satanic delusion. Nothing is yours. Think whatever God has given me, I'm keeping it in his custody. I will use it for his help. I will use it to help others. And in that way, I know that you feel and will continue to feel more and more his blessing. <laughs>